Um, we're going to continue our class now. Uh, we're talking about the principles of discovery. We've gone through the first four principles and we're moving on to principle number five. And here it is. Now remember the principles of discovery are principles that just common sense seekers are they're designed for uh, people that don't have to have supernatural powers or anything, but just kind of people that are just seeking to know the truth. And these are principles that we can apply to help guide us if, if we don't have some revelation from on high or uh, super psychic abilities and this type of thing or contact with some star people or whatever people think. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, we can use these common sense uh, principles to hone things down so we can find the truth many, oftentimes much better than people that claim to be, uh, uh, have revelation from God or, or masters or whatever, you know. Uh, you'll find often that people with just good common sense and uh, thinking ability can be as accurate as, as, as the experts or people that are uh, uh, highly proclaimed prophets or gurus. Okay, we like to say we've covered four and pr here's principle number five. Gather all reliable information you can about a subject of interest and try and see the principles suggested by the data then draw conclusions and run the conclusions by your soul to see if you receive a response. So there's a spiritual rule that says that um, if you want divine assistance, first of all, you have to do everything you can do and find out everything you can on your own. And uh, this seems to apply with everything I found like healing, for instance, um, if you, if you want to be healed, well, first of all, maybe all you need to do to be healed is maybe make a change in diet or go, do some exercises or, or, uh, uh, change your attitude or something like this. Uh, you have to do everything you can do to get healed if, before you will be given divine assistance, because if you can do it on your own with your own intelligence, then uh, it's contrary to the laws of economy for the spiritual powers to come and assist us when we can do it ourselves. Uh, if I need to pick up a book, um, well, I can do it, so I pick up the book. I don't need to have call on some invisible spirit to pick up the book for me because I can just reach and pick up the book. So it's a uh, uh, no divine assistance is going to come pick up the book and read it for me. I have to pick up the book and read it myself. And this is, uh, this is a pr uh, an important principle behind this is that if you uh, want divine assistance, you first of all have to do everything on your own to until you can't do any more. When you reach a roadblock and you still need assistance, then you can legitimately call on it and often get it. I found this to be applicable in my life. I have found that uh, uh, the times that I've had miraculous things happen was when I uh, have done all I could do and I couldn't do any more. And then something seems to come along uh, sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's subtle, but uh, that's when assistance has come. And it rarely will come when you can do it yourself. Do you have any thoughts on um, when you healed that girl when you were just walking down the street that one time in relation to what you were saying? Yeah, that was a little bit of a different uh, situation, I think, because... Uh, when that happened, uh, I 
maybe I ought to review it for those that don't know, but uh, I was just about 15 or 16 years old and a, a friend of mine I was in school with uh, got multiple sclerosis and she lived just a couple blocks from me and I was walking home from school and I saw her hobbling around on crutches in her yard and I stopped and she didn't see me but I watched her a minute and I felt really sorry for her and I was just starting to read the scriptures for the first time in my life and I just read a few and as I was watching her I thought you know, the scripture says that uh, whatever you ask in the name of Christ, you'll be given. So I thought, uh, what is stopping me from just commanding her to be healed in the name of Christ? I said, why shouldn't I do this? <laughs> and uh, then I, the, my, I had an interplay of voices in my head saying, well, uh, I was in the Mormon church and I was in the Mormon church, you can't, you can't administer healing ordinances until you're an elder used between the ages of 19 to 21, you become an elder, then you can legitimately uh, do healing. But I thought, well, I'm not an elder. So uh, maybe I, maybe I shouldn't, maybe that would be wrong for me to command her to be healed. And I went back and forth. I thought, then I thought of the scripture and the scripture, I thought, well, the scripture doesn't say anything about um, uh, having to have the priesthood or anything. It just says, whatsoever you ask in the name of Christ, believing you shall receive. So I thought, uh, I went back and forth in my mind, but then I thought, well, maybe it would be wrong because I'm not authorized. And so I kept going back and forth in my mind and I finally decided to put faith in what was written rather than what the authorities told me. And so I reached forth my hand and I said in a low voice, I, uh, Donna, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to be healed. And when I said that, it felt like a bolt of lightning went through me. And uh, it was so powerful, I almost fell to the ground. <clears throat> And I thought that God was about to strike me dead because I was doing something wrong. <laughs> Scared the dickens out of me. And I ran home as fast as I could <clears throat> and uh, laid on the bed and recuperated and thankful I wasn't dead. <laughs> I thought, boy, I probably shouldn't do that anymore again. Uh, looks like uh, maybe the church was right. I shouldn't have tried to heal anybody. But then uh, two days later at school, I met her and she was walking perfectly well. And I went up to her and asked her, I says, uh, what's going on? I thought you uh, had MS. She says, well, the doctor says I have a remission. I feel perfectly fine now. And uh, I, I never, I, after her school was over, she uh, uh, was in good health all through school. And I never saw her again for 20 years or so later, me and my wife were in a restaurant eating and this lady comes up to me and she says, are you Joe Dewey? And I said, yeah. And she introduced herself and she was the, the same lady again. And so I asked her, she, the, her MS ever come back? And she says, no, but she outlived her husband. <laughs> and uh, uh, matter of fact, uh, I just saw an article about her, or obituary about her in the Statesman about uh, a couple of weeks ago. She did actually die recently, but uh, she lived to be uh, 73, I think. But anyway, that whole thing happened I, for a totally different reason, because that was my first struggle with authority. Do I go with what the authorities say, with what outward authorities do or the inward authority. So I was struggling within myself when I was trying to decide whether or not to try to heal her, to go by what was my, the inward voice was saying, go ahead, or the outward voice of the authority saying, no, you don't, you're not a legitimate uh, authority yet. So I struggled between those two voices and I went with the inner and I think uh, 
that uh, that healing took place to illustrate to con confer to me that I had made the right decision. And I think it was more about that than actually healing her uh, uh, was. But uh, uh, so everything has a purpose. E everything is that happens is around a little bit different purpose. But for me, I think it was an important lesson because there's other times in my life I really wanted to heal somebody and I wasn't able to. But uh, that particular time uh, was, I believe my soul felt it was really important that I understand the importance of following the inner voice above the outer. And I think that uh, that lesson has been a changing uh, point in my life, a very pivotal point in my life for everything I've I've done in my life that's any good is understanding the importance of following the inner voice above the mark of the beast, which is the outer voice, which which uh, takes the place of God is the actual mark of the beast. And uh, that experience helped to guide me toward that uh, understanding which I didn't understand it fully for decades later, but uh, that was the beginning of my understanding of that principle. Okay, any other comments? Yeah, so you think um, you think that you actually ha had an impact on healing her then? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I felt that power go through me. It was so great, I thought God was striking me dead. <laughs> well, one of the... But, I believe uh, that you know at the time, but I yeah. believe that um, in your principles of discovery, one of the sources of truth you mentioned science, I and a few others. One of my sources of truth that I anchor into are in the New Testament. All the the words in red, I I give them stronger credence than probably any other written word that I anchor into. Yeah. And, yeah, and that's part of kind of the principle five here. You gather together reliable information about your subject of interest and that you focus on it, and draw conclusions. And then so for you, the actual words of Jesus are really important. So what you would want to do then is, is go over them regularly and really understand them because you you see in your mind that they are very important words and very true words. Now, you can do this with other things like, uh, of course, what, uh, a teacher many of us here like is uh, uh, the, the works of Alice A. Bailey uh, given to us through DK. And so I spend quite a bit of time with with uh, his writings because if I have the choice between him or some uh, channeled work from uh, somebody named Zor, uh, I, uh, I would maybe kind of give a casual look at the channeled work, see what's there, but uh, between the two, I would focus a lot more on uh, uh, where I think the, the mo most intense light is. And uh, a lot, for a lot of people, it's the world scriptures. If you think the scriptures is the most intense light, then spend quite a bit of time absorbing it. If you think a particular teacher has the most intense light, spend a lot of time absorbing them until you uh, uh, understand them as much as possible. Okay. Um, so any comments on that before we move on? Yeah, I like to think that the word of God is written in every single grain of sand and every drop of water. It's all there. If you just have to learn how to read it. Yeah. So let's say you wanted to know about the Great Pyramid and solve the mysteries of it. If you just watch a couple of YouTube videos, you're probably not going to 
get very far. So what you'd want to do, if you really wanted to solve the uh, mystery of the Great Pyramid, you start reading everything you can about it. Find out everything. Watch the videos, uh, read the books, uh, maybe even take a trip there if you can, uh, and then take all this information, process it, and pretty soon you may start to get flashes of inspiration about it that uh, go beyond anything that's written. But first of all, you have to gather everything you can. If you just have a casual interest in it, you're not going to get any revelation about it. But if you have covered everything possible on it and then reached a dead end, it's quite possible you could get a revelation that goes beyond anything that is written. So if you do everything you can to discover a truth or an understanding or a project or a direction and then need help, then you can legitimately ask for it. And as far as my friend, I guess that would apply to her because I, I didn't have any power to heal her. I had to ask for power to heal her. But the, the uh, uh, help I was given, I think, was beyond that. It was to also to confirm a lesson that I needed. And so there's uh, uh, when extra help comes from spiritual sources, it can uh, be for a number of reasons. Every once in a while, you will have divine intervention in your life that you didn't even seek. Uh, it was just maybe a time appointed by your own soul that uh, uh, would help you along in the right direction. That will happen once in a while. But as far as seeking answers, and help that you specifically want. Uh, if you can do it yourself, well, you're expected to do it yourself first. Uh, do it yourself as far as you can, and then, uh, then is the time to ask after you've done everything. Okay. Well, what you did, Joe, was a purely selfless act. You know, you were young, innocent, uh, pure, you had a pure intent to help someone. And so you were like um, a useful, worthy vessel that, that uh, to heal that woman. And, you know, that was a pretty miraculous thing. Yeah, you probably knew her. Did you know Donna Ashley? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah knew that's her. who it was. I remember she was, yeah, she was handicapped. And then there's, there's a lot said to be said, like you say, about studying something out in your mind, studying it out in your mind, you know, a reason with it in your mind and then contemplate it, you know, and then sometimes you get answers in, in your dreams from your contemplations. Right. And that's part of the uh, reason we uh, come up with these principles of discovery, because this takes us as far as we can on our own. All, all, all these principles, if we apply them, it will take us to our limit and then when we reach our limit, we are capable then of getting divine assistance or entitled to it. Okay, principle number six, use the process of elimination. Now you'd think it'd be a no brainer to use this, but a lot of people don't use it very well because uh, uh, oftentimes they reach points where Things are obviously not true, but they like them, so they ignore it, so they don't eliminate it. So uh, you would think it would be, like I say, uh, um, something that people would uh, like to use or obviously use, but oftentimes they don't. So let's use an example of the process of elimination. Somebody comes to you and gives you some books channeled from this star being called Zor, who we always use the name of Zor in these examples. <laughs> but uh, this guy named Zor, he's, uh, he's higher up than even the Christ. And he's from uh, uh, 
uh, uh, Arcturus or something. And he's, uh, he has, uh, he's channeled all these books to this uh, channeler here. And uh, you have a friend approaching you, he says, uh, oh, yeah, I've, uh, read this book. Uh, it's from Zora, uh, really, really great stuff. Okay, so um, what do you do? There is an oddball chance that Zora has uh, some truth. Maybe, maybe he is some high being, who knows? You know, anything is possible. So the first step to do is read some of the materials, okay? So you study it out and reason it out and you ask yourself, well, uh, is this intelligently enough written that it could be an extra planetary super duper being of some kind? So uh, that's the first question you ask. Second question is, could this person have just made up Zor? So you, you uh, check out the channeler and you ask, could this person have just written this himself? Now, this is a question I ask with, about Alice A. Bailey. Alice A. Bailey tells us that uh, a master called Dwal Kool, Kool uh, sent her this, all this information through mental telepathy. So I examined uh, Alice A. Bailey and things that she actually wrote without any assistance and then compared them to what she wrote that came from Dwell Cool. And it really looked like two different people to me and two different intelligences. And the intelligence from Dwell Cool was much, much higher than just Alice A. Bailey when she spoke or wrote herself. So uh, she passed that test. But oftentimes I've read channeled material that sounds like no higher than the person could have just made up pretty much on their own or that I could have made up. And that's another question I ask myself. If there's this super being channeling this material, is this something uh, that I could have done, made up myself? Could I have just said, could I uh, fabricate some being and say this being is uh, uh, channeling and giving us all this stuff and could I, could I have come up with this on my own? And most of this channeled material, the answer would be yes. Now with the Alice A. Bailey material, the answer is no. That's beyond what I could have just fabricated just using my imagination. So that's one of the reasons I give it a lot of uh, credibility. So uh, we use the process of elimination there. So the, the, you ask if uh, you could have made it up, you look at the intelligence. And another thing you look up that almost every false prophet makes the mistake of doing is they make the mistake of giving specific predictions. Almost every one of them do. Uh, even the ones that say they don't predict, sooner or later they'll slip in some prediction because if they, if they can, if it appeals to the ego. If they can make a prediction that comes true, boy, that really solidifies their base. And so uh, all these guys, they'll wind up making predictions and they will always be wrong. I haven't found one that's right yet, hardly. I can't think of one off the cuff. Uh, stop clock is right uh, twice a day, so every once in a while, maybe one will be close, but uh, uh, not much more than a stop clock for the ones that are uh, not connected to the source. Now, there's a lot of them connected to uh, thought forms, astral entities, their subconscious mind, their own imagination. And uh, these guys always make the mistake of making uh, specific prophecies that do not come true. Now the smart ones make the prophecies long way in the future. So when they're dead, they, uh, uh, when they're alive, they don't have to answer for them. The ones that aren't so bright makes prophecies just a couple of years in the future. A whole bunch of them made prophecies about 2012 that the world is going to change. We're going to move to the fifth dimension. We're going to have a new heaven, new earth. 
a uh, whole bunch of prophecies was around that date and a lot of people fell for it. I'd say about two thirds of the channelers made prophecies around 2012 that did not come true. And uh, wasn't that just the end of the Mayan calendar? Right. Well, uh, I made a prophecy about it that did come true. I said 2012 wouldn't be much different than 2011. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why would it, it be? be true? <laughs> okay. Um, so the next thing to look for is money. Is the uh, is the guru or prophet or teacher? Do they seem to be in it for the money? Are they living high on the hog on the donations? And uh, are they always hitting everybody up for money? And then do they use it pretty much a lot of it for themselves? And uh, so if they are, the chances are that uh, they're not totally dedicated toward the spiritual path. Because if he's dedicated on the spiritual path, uh, money will only be important for him to be able to fulfill his function and that'll that'll be uh, it. Okay, so by the process of elimination, you take things that are obviously false, like uh, if somebody made, claims to be uh, in speaking for Christ or God or Moses or whoever and makes a prophecy that a specific prophecy that turns out to be completely false, then you can pretty much eliminate him because you can think, well, you know, the real Christ would be smart enough to know whether or not that event would happen. Uh, so obviously, I can eliminate this guy as having a valid contact of some kind. So uh, what's interesting about these guys when they do make specific prophecies and they always cover their bases and regroup and often will make a, another prophecy. Like uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the founder Charles T. Russell, he uh, first of all predicted the coming of Christ, I think something like, I, he made three predictions. The first one, didn't come true. And so he said, he recalculated, he just calculated wrong. So he recalculated and he made another one and it didn't, didn't come true. And his third one, I can't remember the first two dates, but the third date was 1914. And so he says, third, he, he told his followers, this one is definitely it. This, this is it. 1914, Christ is going to come. Okay, 1914 came and gone and no Christ showed up. So he had, he thought, well, what am I going to do here? So he said, uh, well, all the prophecies, all the signs indicate 1914. So he did come in 1914, but he came invisibly. <laughs> so to this day, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Christ came in 1914, but it was invisible. So, uh, uh, they still, um, so that, that guy was smart enough to uh, come up with an explanation that allowed him to keep his job. <laughs> but it's interesting to watch these guys when they do make a prediction that doesn't come true, how they will cover their bases. And uh, uh, okay, any comments on the uh, process of elimination? Well, we move on to uh, yeah yeah JJ uh, I got a question um, in uh, the statement uh, the, you know that God made uh, to Moses says uh, I am become I am that I I am becoming or yeah kind of how you phrase it uh, yeah. meaning that uh, even God doesn't really know. You know, because everything can become a new or whatever during any process. Well, uh, going along with that, is it possible that uh, Christ, like what you'd said, well, Christ would know what was uh, somebody made a prophecy and they thought it was true, and, and Christ uh, went along with it, that it could change under the pretense of uh, God saying, I, I am becoming. Is it possible? Well, that Christ this is. Would know this that this is a thing that a lot of people do. They'll say, well, things have changed, so the prophecy didn't come to pass. But uh, 
there is a prophecy in the Bible that definitely didn't happen. Was a prophecy of uh, uh, um, Jonah. Couldn't think of his name. Jonah got swallowed by the fish. Remember that story? He he didn't want to go to Nineveh because Nineveh had a reputation of being a really draconian place. I mean, they'd skin you alive if they didn't like it there in Nineveh. So he that he didn't want to go there because <laughs> it was re really a dangerous place. And the, the people and God told him you got to go there and preach them, preach to them repentance. So Jonah goes. Uh, tries to not go there because he was afraid of going there. And the story is that he was swallowed by this fish that spitted him up at Nineveh, so he had to go there. And God told him, okay, go tell these people to repent or they're going to be destroyed. So Jonah goes into Nineveh and he says, repent or else in 40 days shall pass, you shall, uh, fire shall come down out of heaven and consume you or something like that, he told him. And so he made the prophecy, and then he went up on a hill, and he waited and, and was going to just enjoy watching Nineveh be destroyed. But the people took his message to heart, and they <laughs> dressed in sackcloth, and they prayed and repented, and the 40 days passed, and Nineveh wasn't destroyed. And meanwhile, during this time, this, I uh, uh, can't remember the name of the tree, a certain type of tree grew up and, and provided Jonah with shade. And when Nineveh wasn't destroyed, the, uh, the tree was destroyed and he lost his shade and he was grumbling about losing the shade of this tree. And he was also grumbling to God, how come you didn't destroy these people? You made me into a false prophet. And God says, look at you. He says, you're more concerned about losing the shade of the tree than you are about those people. Those people have repented, and so I'm not going to destroy them. So uh, uh, he says, shape up, Jonah, because you should be happy about this, not angry that uh, we haven't destroyed them. So uh, circumstances do change, but... Uh, uh, whether or not Jonah took the actual message from God, who knows? Perhaps uh, he embellished it somewhat. But uh, circumstances do change. But when a specific prophecy is given, um, unless there is uh, an obvious change that takes place, the uh, uh, a true prophet or a true messenger will give an out. He'll say, repent or be destroyed. And, uh, uh, or something, something to that effect. Or if this happens, then this will happen. So uh, the true prophets or the true messengers, words will be true. The false messengers, many of their words will be false. And just as simple as that. Yeah, but that prophecy had a contingency attached to it. Yeah, did he make a contingency? I don't remember on that for sure. Yeah, yeah. If you repent, you you won't be destroyed. I don't remember if that was in there or not. It, it, so it, yeah, it there was, was in the original message. Yeah. <laughs> but that's generally the idea around repentance in the Bible. If people repent, then things will change. Yeah, if you don't repent. That's why they did repent, obviously, because they thought God would uh, not destroy them if they did repent. Yeah. But, uh, okay. Well, that would be kind of mean of God to destroy them after they repented. And, well, yeah. And, and felt, you know, really, really sorrowful for being such a bad, wicked people. And then they changed their ways. And God said, well, that's too bad. i got to kill you now because my prophet said so. Yeah, even if Jonah didn't make it clear, the people basically understood that that was a deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think but, so. Uh, okay, principle number seven, seek out proven authorities and learn from them. That kind of goes along with what uh, principle number five, find reliable information. But proven authorities, 
there's two types of authorities in the world. There's earned authorities and unearned authorities. And uh, in the spiritual world, an unearned authority is somebody that claims to represent God that has no actual legitimate claim to represent God. Uh, an earned authority is someone that merely um, teaches truth and has a record of the truth being accurate, but he won't claim to represent God for you because there's only one place you'll find God. And where's that at? Oh, well, inside. Right, within yourself. So if anyone claims to speak for God to you, he's, he's an unearned authority and he's participating in the mark of the beast. He's participating as being an, an arm of the beast, a part of the beast. Because, and th this is, happens in the churches today. The churches today, we have preachers telling us what the will of God is. And uh, uh, they don't have any authority to tell us what the will of God is because that can only be verified with them. I guess they can quote a scripture and say, and the scripture says the will of God is such and such. But, uh, uh, but when... When people, when you allow an outside authority to represent the will of God to you, and this happens a lot in the Mormon church, some of us grew up in, and uh, we have authorities saying we have a moral decision to make, and from some authority in the church says this is what you must do, and you're taught that you need to follow because it's God's will. So what you're allowing then is for uh, an unearned authority, somebody taking the place of God to speak the word of God to you. And that must come from within. Now someone outwardly can teach. And if he doesn't claim to represent God or ultimate truth, then he leaves it up to you. That's the way it should be. So a true teacher will teach, leave it up to the person. And if he teaches the truth, the student can check within and, and that's where God is. And so by checking within, he then verifies whether or not what he received from the teacher or the book or whatever is true. Then he can receive uh, true verification. So isn't that what uh, most uh, Orthodox churches are doing? Uh, they're uh, taking the place of speaking uh, to you from God? Right. Just about all, everybody, and probably 99% of the religious people uh, go by an outside God. And even the Bible itself is an outside God. In other words, they think, well, the Bible says this, so that settles it. You know, instead of thinking, well, the Bible says this, how does this register to my inner soul? You know, even if the Bible is 100% correct and the way it's worded, we can misinterpret the wording. You can take the words of Jesus himself and uh, apply a wrong interpretation. That's why we have all, thousands of different Christian uh, religions interpreting them all different ways. And so... Uh, the only way you get the right interpretation is relying on what's within. But as soon as you let someone from without tell you what the word of God is and you accept it just because they say it, or because even the Bible says it, or any holy book, or any holy writing, or any holy authority, you're, you're accepting the mark of the beast. This also applies to politics. If your political leaders say this is true and this is how what you need to think, and if you go along with it without questioning, you've received the mark of the beast. And so uh, there's all kinds of unearned authorities, authorities that claim power that they don't really have. Now, let's uh, clarify what an earned earned authority is in just regular life. 
if you go to a class and you want to learn Spanish, an earned authority that's a teacher would be somebody that can speak Spanish, you heard them speak and you know they're speaking accurately, so this guy knows how to speak the language. If you go to another class and the guy can't speak it, but he says he can still teach you, then he's an unearned authority. An unearned authority is someone that can demonstrate what he claims to be an authority on. And there's no authority in the world, though, that can demonstrate that they represent God without. Nobody does that. But there are certain earned authorities that are uh, uh, experts in their field that are worth listening to. For instance, uh, say an earned authority with me is uh, Dwal Cool through Alice A. Bailey. Okay? I've checked him out and my soul has registered a lot of the things he says, but what if I come across something that just doesn't register right? Do I just accept it because he said it, even though he's an earned authority? How should we approach that? With somebody that's maybe, let's say you trust me as an earned authority. Let's say I say something that just doesn't make sense to you. What should you do? Should you just accept it? Oh, yes, Brother Joe. <laughs> right. Matter of fact, we've been talking in the past couple of posts I made about uh, D DK's uh, a statement DK made that a lot of us thought was somewhat screwy, and we've been talking about it and analyzing it. And this is what you need to do. It uh, doesn't matter how much you trust an authority. Nobody's perfect for one thing. Doesn't, even if you're a master, you, you, your language isn't perfect in communicating to uh, language is imperfect to begin with. So uh, if something doesn't make sense, don't trust it until it does make sense. That's the thing. Okay. I so, think uh, any, anybody that's been a leader or a teacher for very long has already figured out that there's just some things you can't say. Uh, you can only say, well, there's three doors there. I, I think it might be behind door number three, but you have to open the door. I can't do it for you. Exactly. Now, interestingly enough, there is a field where people that excel, almost all of them are earned authorities. What field do you, do you think that is? What, science? No. Math? No. What well, field math, can we master, trust master people? degree, but uh, yeah, I, I never thought of math, but uh, basic math, yeah. Uh, but there's another one I'm thinking of, and you've been watching it on TV the past day or two. Oh, the Olympics? <laughs> Sports, yeah. Sports? So, so you take somebody that, say, uh, um, I was just watching um skateboarding championship last night and i thought boy those guys are good and uh you could pick any one of those guys and say teach me how to skateboard and you know that this guy knows what he's doing he knows the ins and outs of skateboarding so these uh these guys in the olympics every one of them are earned authority on what they're doing <laughs> unlike uh preachers and scientists and politicians, a lot of them are not earned authorities. A lot of them are wrong half the time. Uh, but uh, these, these sports figures that have really trained and gotten some high, high physical skills, you gotta admit that these guys know what they're doing and if they give you some clues about uh, being a better swimmer or track guy or boxer or whatever, uh, or fencer, uh, you know that uh, they know what they're talking about. So I was just thinking about that when I was watching the Olympics. You know, this is one area of life that has a lot of earned authorities in it. You know, Now, an under-earned authority in sports would be uh, somebody that teaches you uh, about a sport, but he can't do it very good himself, then 
he wouldn't be a very good earned authority. And now what's interesting about sports too is we have the uh, coaches of teams and they are very uh, particular about getting people enlisted on their team. Uh, Cause oftentimes they got to pay them millions of dollars too. Say like in football, uh, they are very fussy about making sure they get uh, people that have earned their own authority, that are authorities and know what they're doing and can do it well. And uh, wouldn't it be great if politics was as efficient as a football team in getting quality people to uh, uh, workforce? that uh, we could think, boy, this guy can really throw a pass. <laughs> that congressman really threw a good pass to that other congressman and passed this budget that makes a lot of sense. I'll Look, tell you uh, one thing. I'm kind of curious and got oh. food for... Oh, sorry, I put you on mute there. I'll tell you one thing uh, the coaches teach these athletes is self-trust. That little black gymnast, a gal can, can flip three times in the air and somersault and do a spiral. Yeah. And she has to have a high level of self-trust to be able to do that. All of yeah, those. you know, I was thinking of watching some of these people, I was thinking, how, how in the world do they even learn to do this stuff? That's pretty step amazing. Step by step. Yeah. So uh, not my mission in this particular life to do that type of stuff, but I admire the ones that do. <laughs> But, uh, okay, any comments? Uh, Stacy, did you have something? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, yeah, I was uh, getting a little food for thought. Is This is the first time that these Olympic uh, first people will not have a, a spectator crowd. And yeah. I was kind of curious if this is really yeah. going to affect their um, performance. Are they going to perform it? Because, you know, you get the energy from the crowd cheering you on and stuff. But well, without that being present, I wonder how their performance is going to be overall. Are they going to give their best or, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I wonder if the overall uh, winners this time might, uh, their records may be a little bit less than average. I know with our, our local football team, uh, Boise State here, uh, we win a lot more at home than we do when we uh, have a, the away games. It's amazing would probably win twice as many home games. Matter of fact, we hardly ever lose a home game. So uh, you, you get the crowd rooting for you. That, that just inspires the athletes to, to perform better. So yeah, it probably will. It's probably a little harder for them in the Olympics this year, but uh, uh, kind of feel bad for them, but- uh, Still uh, fun to watch. Yeah. But hopefully they feel the world watching them. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments or questions before we wrap it up, my friends? What was the uh, DK comment that was uh, in question? Oh, it was about um, the the future of the world when the new age is in. He said that uh, all the produce, the wheat, the oil, and everything would be controlled by international group and distributed. And so I think, well, does this mean if you grow an acre of wheat in your backyard, the government's going to come take it and we just decide where it goes and sounded like communism almost. So anyway, we were talking about that uh, in, the, in a couple uh, posts that we made there. So that's, that's uh, one thing he made that a number of uh, uh, free marketers are uh, kind of suspicious about there. But other, other, other comments he's made about uh, freedom and everything has been really, uh, really good. So anyway, we ex explained that. We, I wound up explaining it by saying it was a projection into the future, not necessarily saying if he agreed or disagreed, but he's, he's pretty much predicting about how things would wind up between capitalism and socialism, that we'd have a mixture uh, of them both. And uh, well, I think he thinks that the race was going to evolve a lot faster than it has. The new age people would become more uh, 
have a stronger voice in the world than we do. So. Yeah, some of his predictions uh, centered around the time period we're in now. Uh, sounds like we should be a lot farther ahead than we are. So yeah. uh, uh, hopefully we can do some catch up work and and promote goodwill and everything. Catch, catch up. Yeah. Okay, any other comments? I don't predict anything, especially the future. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty safe. Just predict the future that you have control over is the thing. I think that's what the masters do. The masters act, can manipulate the future to a degree so they can predict it to a degree. That, now, DK says they meet once every hundred years in conclave because they can kind of see what's going to happen about a hundred years into the future. And beyond a hundred years, it's a lot harder to predict. So they meet once every hundred years to plan ahead the next hundred years. And their next meeting will be 2025, not very far away. And after 2025, he indicates there's going to be some major revelations given out. So, uh, but he doesn't say how that's going to happen. But uh, so it'll be interesting. Okay, any other comments or questions? I just want to say that I saw something last night on the news that uh, in Connecticut, all of the uh, elections are funded by the state and it eliminates the corruption of uh, the lobbyists and all this. And I think that's a model that has to spread throughout the country where political parties uh, are funded by the government. Yeah, the only trouble with that is, say, if you don't have a lot of pull, then you can't, you really can't get in on it. But well, you uh, have to, you have to show that you can raise on your own a certain amount of money first, and then they give you millions of dollars. A mad sum or something. Yeah. I mean, but it the problem is it sort of shifts the corruption to another power base, the corruption of the state versus the corruption of special interest groups well the state the state doesn't have any leverage other than to, to give you the money if you can show that you uh, you have a following yeah yeah it's uh people are going to grumble about it no matter what system that we install there so uh, <laughs> the best thing is to experiment with different ones this this is one good thing about having 50 states and letting the different states do things different ways. If one state proves that something really works, then uh, other states can follow. And so it's good that we have this diversity of governments. And uh, so, okay, uh, my friends, uh, good, uh, good vibes with you today. And we will, I believe we'll do the question and answer thing next week. And we'll also invite the uh, Keys members Give and throw out an invitation to them to, to come. And so we'll uh, see you next uh, Sunday at 10 a.m. All being well. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, Have everyone. a great week. Thank you.